Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Let's Pod This, the official podcast of Let's Fix This. My name is Andy Moore, and I am your host. Today on the program, we're going to talk to two very special guests, the executive director of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy, Mr. Joe Dorman. Uh, Joe is going to talk to us about, to give us his take on the state budget situation, uh, where we're looking for revenue, what options there might be, uh, and maybe his inside uh, opinion uh, on what we're going to do as a state since the Supreme Court struck down the cigarette tax measure a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Then later in the program, we'll be joined by Trey Thompson, who is the project manager for the Capital Restoration Project down there at 23rd and Lincoln, working on the Capitol itself, um, something a little maybe uh, non-political, though still involves state budget uh, to some degree. Uh, Really important work going on there. And honestly, it's pretty cool. Um, We've got a blog post on our website, letsfixthisok.org slash blog. If you want to go straight to it, that's a really easy way. Uh, Some pictures and uh, a little bit of uh, facts and figures about that project. Next, we're joined by former legislator and gubernatorial candidate Joe Dorman. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good morning. It's great to talk to you. Thanks. So, Joe, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for the state legislature. Um, you know, as, as we've discussed last week in our episode, uh, the state legislature passed three revenue measures that were challenged in the courts. And last week, the Supreme Court ruled that one of them, the cigarette tax, was unconstitutional, which blows a $215 million hole in the state budget. What's your take on that? We expected this to happen. Many of us that were working at the Capitol knew when the bill was changed from a tax to a fee that it would likely not hold up to constitutional scrutiny with Article 5, Section 33 of the Constitution, most commonly known as State Question 640. In that, there are three parameters that must be met. You must get a three-fourths vote of both bodies of the legislature to pass something immediately or a majority and send it to a vote of the people in the general election every other November. You must start the revenue-raising measures in the House of Representatives, and you cannot pass a revenue-raising measure in the final five days of the legislative session. This Senate bill that created the cigarette fee uh, did not meet any of the three priorities within that constitutional language. Therefore, the court struck it down on all of those. We're awaiting the final ruling on the other revenue fees that were passed, but it's really hard to say what's going to happen with the court on those. But besides that, you hit it right on the head. We have well over a $200 million shortfall in the budget now because that was allocated in the FY18 budget. Therefore, that money will not be there, and so the state's going to operate with $200 million less. And that's where the call for a special session has come into play, uh, asking the governor to set the call and the legislature to come back and find a solution to filling that gap. Yeah, I want to come back to the special session thing. Uh, But back about state question 640, I think the thing that kind of boggles my mind in the minds of lots of Oklahomans out there is that uh, we all knew about State Question 640. Some of us had forgotten, certainly, but, I mean, you knew about it. Certainly the lawmakers in the Capitol knew about it. And so to have them go ahead and pass these laws that even some of them said at the time they thought might be ruled unconstitutional seemed like a really bad idea. Why do you think they went ahead and passed them anyway? It was a gamble. It was a test with the court to see if they would uphold it. Uh, it's not been tested since it passed in the early 1990s. In fact, there's only been one or two tax bills that have been filed at the Capitol in that period of time, and none have made it through the process, even to get the majority of votes to send it to a vote of the people. Uh, so we suspected this would be the case, and the danger in this came with playing with the budget to take this test. It would have been different if it would have been additional revenue and they had a balanced budget without the bills. But because this happened this way, uh, we're going to see that cut to the state agencies, primarily health care agencies, 
and that's going to be devastating for many of the services that are offered. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Department of Mental Health is facing like a 23% cut. I mean, that's one out of $4 they get would be cut. That's devastating. Yes, and there is some discussion going on. Because that bill was passed and it directed fees, uh, that would be built into the budget. But the budget spells out how much money goes to each agency, and there was not a line item in the budget this year. So there is some argument that the pain could be spread across all the different agencies where it wouldn't impact mental health as much. But again, that's another thing that would have to be decided by the courts and would have to be determined. And the the executive branch allocates those dollars to each of the agencies, and if they took that path, it would be interesting to see if anybody would challenge that. But that's a completely different discussion. Right now, we have to worry about the reality of the now, and that is, what are we going to do to to call upon our policymakers to fix this problem they've created? And we need to make sure that they understand that they have to find consensus. They have to sit at the table and find some point of negotiation and agreement where they can fill that gap. And that's going to be a difficult point because now that they're at home, now that they're out of the legislative session, the regular session meets from the first Monday in February to the final Friday in May at the longest they can serve. And then any time beyond that, they have to be called back for a special session by the governor. And many of these folks are back home working their jobs. Uh, Some probably have vacations planned. School is starting up. We're not going to see an immediate special session happen. If the governor were to call it today, it still probably wouldn't happen for a few weeks to a month because the legislative leadership are, is going to allow time for their members to rearrange their schedules so they can come back in. So whatever's going to happen with this budget, it's something we're probably going to have to live with for a short period of time. Yeah, it's going to be a few months. Now, we've talked a lot about, and you hear a lot about in the news, about the special session. Um, do you think that there is going to be a special session this year? The governor, in a press statement, said that there is a need for the special session, and that is, uh, I believe, it's her intent to call one. Now we have to wait and see if the legislative leadership will agree to come back. They have said publicly they would, but there is much discussion in the inner circles of the Capitol saying that there are a lot of legislators that don't want to come back. They would rather the agencies operate, allocate those dollars, and then when they come back in February, allocate a supplemental appropriation to fill those gaps. Now, yeah, I, that's a dangerous way to do business. There's a lot of kind of reading between the lines, I think, that I've uh, picked up on in the last week. So Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb said he thinks that there's money that they can just shuffle things around and cover these um, shortfalls with money that's already there, which seems... I mean, that's just Robin Peter to pay Paul at best. Um, And then it's pretty clear, I think, that the Speaker's office doesn't want to come back for a special session, and they are looking for um, some other ways, again, to kind of shuffle money around and maybe avoid that special session. But it really was funny yesterday uh, when the governor's statement came out. She said, like, there must be a special session. It's kind of like there needs to be one. And so seeing the different news outlets try to parse out what that actually meant. Some of the headlines said she calls for a special session, which is different than calling a special session. She stopped just short of actually telling them, hey, you need to come back on this date for this reason. Uh, Do you think that was intentional or do you think she's, is it just like a a game of chicken that's being played up there? I do. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt in the governor's office. I think they are waiting to see what the Supreme Court will do with the other bills. But the reality is we know there's $200 million plus out of the budget now. And so for that fact alone, a special session needs to be called now. They, I would say they don't need to set the date yet because they don't want to call a special session, come back and deal with that, and then have to call another special session uh, the week after they come up with a solution to come back and deal with the next issue if the Supreme Court were to strike it down. Right, one so of the other bills. I understand why they're not wanting to do it. They would like to do it all at once to find out how much money they need to fill in the gap. So from that perspective as a former legislator, I understand why they're – they're holding their breath and waiting to see what the Supreme Court will do. Sure. But they do need to set that schedule, at least in discussions, 
and notify their members of these are the potential dates just to make sure that they will have enough there because you have to remember if we're going to do a revenue raising measure it takes three-fourths of both bodies so they would have to have at least 76 members present and voting yes in the House of Representatives. And in a special session, when people might be gone, it's going to be even more difficult to get those numbers. So they have to plan this out thoroughly if they want to see success. (laughs) The other thing I think that's maybe important to point out is that even if they filled the $200 million, even if they... Even if the other two measures are also ruled unconstitutional and they, let's say they fill all three of them back to the level that they were supposed to be at, that's still much less than what the everyone, I think most people hoped the budget was going to be for this year because that would just be kind of getting us back. But they didn't even fill the whole, the whole hole <laughs> that they started with this past year. Do you think um, at best we're still looking at starting this upcoming session in February with another budget shortfall? There's no doubt we're looking at uh, looking at gaps that will have to be filled in the next budget just based on how this framework of the current budget was built. We know we're going to be starting off with less money just because of those commitments. And we still, we still don't know what's going to happen at the federal government. There is the threat of many federal programs being eliminated, and that means a loss of matching dollars. Many state programs receive a three-to-one, sometimes a four-to-one match. So for every dollar they invest – they will get $3 or $4 to add to that from the federal government to run these programs. That's crazy. We see a, yeah, if we see a cut from the federal government, the state either has to increase the revenue going in or they have to downsize those programs. So we're getting it from both sides. We, we simply don't know what's going to happen month to month with these budgets based on changes at the federal government. So they need to be nimble. They need to be on their feet. They need to be... Uh, Plan, they need to plan contingencies of what might happen. And for government to be proactive like that, it's a change in the mindset. So I'm hoping our legislative leadership and the governor's office are thinking along those lines to plan the worst-case scenarios and be prepared in case it might happen. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's certainly uncertain times. Uh, Joe, one last question. What do you think that in these uncertain times, what can we as – you know, as as voters, as constituents, how can we be nimble? What what can we do to try to help uh, nudge our lawmakers in the right direction? I'm going to give a pitch to one of the programs we've done at OICA. We have an advocacy guide and a legislative process guide on our website at OICA.org. Study and learn the process. If you're educated on how a bill becomes a law, and it's well beyond the old schoolhouse rock cartoon, you have to understand the process and the steps and be willing to contact your legislators, your senator and your representative. And I understand that the term constituent means the senator and representative you vote for. You live in their legislative district. Contact those people that you have that ability to vote for them or vote them out of office. Let them know how important it is to fill these gaps and make sure that the budget is balanced as is required by the Constitution. And go to town hall meetings. Uh, I know uh, in uh, the Oklahoma City metro area around the capital, Jason Dunnington is one of those great ones that does regular town hall meetings. Many legislators do that around the state. Attend and make sure your voice is heard, and don't be angry. Be a positive voice in the room and encourage them to do the right thing. And if you have to hold them accountable, remember that at the ballot box. But be a part of the solution. Encourage them to do the right thing and let them know there are voters out there watching and waiting and encouraging them to do what's right. And that means protecting these programs, especially those ones that impact kids, the elderly, those with special needs. Those are the ones that government is certainly there to protect because there is a great need there. And we have to keep those programs in place if we want to see our society continue. Thanks, Joe. That's uh, really helpful. And that's, you know, one of the things that we at Let's Fix This really try to do is to um, help people understand how to uh, how to learn those rules, how to engage. And like you said, it is much more complicated than just the old Schoolhouse Rocks video. Uh, we've got some events coming up in Enid uh, and then some here kind of around the metro. Um, we'll be going to Mustang, hopefully Edmond as well, to do those kind of training information sessions so that uh, so that folks can learn how to engage uh, easier and more uh, effectively. So 
Thanks so we much. We appreciate y'all's partnership and the advocacy day at the Capitol, and you're doing tremendous work. And let's fix this is a part of the solution. Y'all are as an organization are making a difference at the Capitol, and from the perspective of OICA, where we're the advocates at the Capitol for Kids, I appreciate the partnership with y'all and the work that y'all are doing. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Joe. Hey, thanks for talking to us today. Have a great one. Okay, so that was Joe Dorman. He's the executive director of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy, uh, certainly a friend of the pod, and we look forward to partnering with them again next year during session uh, for another day at the Capitol. Uh, Joe also is a former state legislator and a former candidate for governor here in Oklahoma. And lest we forget, he was a city council member for the burgeoning metropolis of Rush Springs, Oklahoma, home of, you may know this, the famous Rush Springs Watermelon Festival. That's honestly, for my money, one of the best uh, small town festivals in the state. Uh, I also really like the Kalachi Festival in Prague, Oklahoma. I grew up in Texas where kalachis are a a meat-filled pastry, but up here I've learned they serve the traditional Czech kalachi, which is more like a a pastry with some kind of like a fruit tart. Um, But man, live music, Lots of vendors, um, all these small town festivals. If you uh, want something fun to do on a weekend, uh, check it out. They are always a good time. So a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to tour the state capital restoration project that's being headed up by Trey Thompson. Uh, he's the project manager for the Capital Restoration Project, and we have Trait on the phone with us right now. Trait, how are you? I'm doing great, Andy. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks for joining us. Hey, uh, so that was super impressive, um, getting to walk around the building and see, you know, I, th- I think see the basement uh, all the way to the rooftop and seeing all the different things that you guys are doing there. Can you give us a few maybe just kind of general facts about the restoration project? I know I saw some painted on the wall, and they were really impressive. Absolutely. You know, uh, we started this project when the legislature passed our first bond issue in 2014. They passed a subsequent bond issue in 2016 after we'd had a chance to do a thorough investigation of the whole building, which really hadn't been done uh, previously. We came to the conclusion that it's a $245 million project. It's going to take place over about eight years. Uh, We have not um, evacuated the building. uh, uh, So we are doing this project while the Capitol is still in operation, which adds a certain bit of logistical challenge. But really, our our problem in this building for a long time has been uh, failing infrastructure in the building. So when we talk about mechanical systems, air conditioning, we talk about an uh, old electrical system, we talk about a uh, uh, plumbing that has long since passed its useful life. On the exterior, we talk about um, failing stone and mortar joints, windows that were 100 years old and, and once again, long past their, their time to, to be repaired and restored. And so what we're doing is a comprehensive top-to-bottom restoration a uh, few facts and figures, you know, we have 21 and a half miles of mortar joints on this building that we have to grind out and replace with new mortar. We have 477 windows that we are uh, that we are restoring. Uh, on the inside, we have 65 miles of abandoned cabling. <laughs> we are going to uh, put in about 3,600 linear feet of, uh, of plumbing. Uh, And that's 47 times the height of the Tulsa Golden Driller, you know, some of those fun little statistics we have on the wall uh, as you walk in on the west entrance of of the building. So this project is is massive in scope. It's not unlike other capital restoration projects that are going on across the country right now. One of the things that's a bit of a point of pride for us is that we're actually doing this in a... um, in an efficient way uh, and doing it cheaper than many other state capitals have done it because we've we've done it in a way that that makes financial sense and so whereas you've had other capitals like minnesota and kansas that have topped out over the 300 million dollar mark we'll do ours for about the 250 million dollar mark which is uh, uh, of great use of the taxpayer dollars of the citizens of oklahoma yeah i mean i think a lot of people you know 
uh, a lot of folks have a hard time whenever we spend money on stuff to do with the capital or the people who work there. Um, but as someone who just has started spending some time at the capital, it was really evident, uh, even last year in 2016, when we first started going, um, to see how far in disrepair the building was. Uh, and that really hit home, I think, when I walked through the tunnel from the east lot that's across Lincoln there. And it wasn't even a rainy day, and it was just leaking. <laughs> and there was kind of buckets every uh, 50 feet or so. Uh, and I know that that tunnel is subject to flooding as as well as other parts of the building. And so getting to walk around with you that day was really interesting. Um, and something else that I wrote down that you pointed out was that like 80% of the capital was not covered by uh, fire suppression sprinklers going into this project. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. In fact, as I talk to you on this, I'm looking above my ceiling here and there's no fire sprinkler system in my particular area of the building and in most areas of the building that haven't been renovated within the past five or seven years. Uh, and that's a major thing that we're doing. You know, it's life safety, bringing this building up to code. Uh, all the areas that we're redesigning in the building, we're making sure they have the proper clearances for ADA accessibility. Uh, the chambers, we're redoing parts of the, of the House and Senate chambers to make sure that uh, disabled people can access those areas and be able to see their, their government in, in focus. And so, you know, when you talk about a project like this and you talk about the state capitol, I think, you know, sometimes people might think that, oh, this is just politicians making their offices nicer. And that's not the case at all. You know, when you look at a building like this, first of all, it's our iconic building of the state of Oklahoma. It's a major tourist attraction. People come here not only from all over the country and all over the world, and it really is Oklahoma's front door. So that the impression they get here will, uh, in many cases, kind of form their impression of Oklahoma. But on top of that, this is where the, the, the work of democracy gets done. This is where the people get a chance to interact with their elected officials. And because of that, we want to make this a productive place to do that. Um, we want to make sure that committee rooms are accessible. We want to make sure that the building has the right technology to be able to broadcast what we're doing here to the world and so that people can see their government in action. And then when groups like yours and Let's Fix This come up, um, we make sure that it's a place that's, that, once again, is easier for people to be able to do the work of, of advancing their causes. And so uh, this truly being the people's building, uh, this is far from a cosmetic project. This is actually a project to enhance functionality, to enhance uh, people's experiences in this building, and really to, to enhance the functioning of government at the state legislative level. Right. And as you said to me that day, we use the building in fundamentally different ways now than we did 100 years ago. I mean, 100 years ago, we didn't have cars or airplanes or computers or uh, video cameras and all these things that uh, we do now. Uh, and even uh, even something you kind of referenced, uh, motorized wheelchairs. And we've had folks come to some of our events and they have a really difficult time getting in the elevators, getting off the elevators, and getting into the House or Senate chambers so that they can kind of see what's going on. And um, I think those of us that maybe don't have those kinds of um, disabilities take it for granted that we can walk in and walk up a whole bunch of steps um, into a tight area and sit down. And that's not the case for everybody. And so to make it more accessible for lots of folks is going to be a big deal. And I think, I don't know about it, what you've heard, but I know a lot of people are very excited <laughs> that the rotunda will be air conditioned for the first time in the building's history. Absolutely. It's one of, uh, one of my personal favorite things as someone who works in this building, you know, uh, a lot of times people are here in the springtime for a legislative session. They don't really see the building during other parts of the year. And in the spring, um, you know, it's, uh, the building obviously has lots of stone around it. So it's a fairly well insulated building and it's not too bad. But if you're in this building in July and August, this actually can be very hot and humid in those public areas and those rotundas. And then in, in December and January, it can be very cold in, in those areas. And so not only is that, first of all, just off-putting and it's uncomfortable to visitors and people who have to work here, but we have millions of dollars worth of unique artwork to the state of Oklahoma that hangs in this building. And these swings and temperatures and these fluctuations in humidity are not good for the long-term preserva preservation of our of our state art collection. 
And so one of the things that conditioning the rotunda is going to do is it's going to put that work in a stable stable environment, and it's going to help us uh, to make sure it lasts, you know, so that our, our kids and grandkids can enjoy it as well. Right. That would be great. It was uh, funny. Last year in 2016 when we first started bringing groups of people up there, uh, there were two occasions that we had groups march to the Capitol from a school, uh, and they uh, the second time, which was right at the end of session um, there in late May, uh, we had about 200 people that walked from Douglas High School to the Capitol, and it was pretty warm that morning. And they got inside, and they were uh, <laughs> visibly disappointed that the heat and the humidity continued even once they were inside. So, uh, and I think there's, I mean, kind of anecdotally, there's that as the uh, as the temperature rises in the Capitol, just in fervor and intensity of arguments towards the end of session, you know, every year. Um, it's no coincidence, I think, that the physical temperature uh, inside the building begins to rise and it makes some of those um, gatherings more difficult or tense or something. So uh, this is very exciting changes, I think, for the Capitol. Um, now, Trey, this isn't your first time to work at the Capitol. What did you do before you were project manager uh, for this restoration project? So I worked for uh, for four years in Pro Tem Brian Bingman's office as his policy advisor. And one of the things that I worked on during that time was uh, a funding bill for the capital project. My boss, uh, Brian Bingman, was, was very passionate about fixing the capital building. Um, the Senate put out a bill, I think, in 2012, and it got... It passed the Senate, and it got maybe 15 or 16 votes on the floor of the House chamber that year. And we came back again in 2013, and they worked out this, uh, you know, bill where they would do uh, a little bit of cash for the Capitol, and then they, they coupled it with a tax cut. Well, the Supreme Court threw that out and said that this is log rolling. And so finally, uh, third time's the charm in 2014, they were able, able to pass the first bond issue, which was $120 million. At that point, I was so personally invested in the project, and I, I'd been chairing the Capital Preservation Commission for a year or so. Um, I really felt uh, I really felt called to this project. I really felt like I wanted to go and make sure it's done right. Uh, I'm passionate about history. I'm passionate about architecture and what what a building like this means to Oklahoma. And I also wanted to make sure that. We did things a little bit differently uh, on this project than, than some other state construction projects I'd seen. You know, I think the the culture of Oklahoma for a long time has been, you know, how cheap can we do things and how fast can we do things? And, you know, for me, this project is about working to change the culture. Let's put the emphasis on quality. Let's not spend money that we don't need to spend, obviously. We need to be good uh, guardians of the taxpayer dollar. But let's make sure that the things that we're doing are going to ensure that the building has uh, a long-lasting effect. You know, one of the things that uh, that I point out as an example of this is we are on the scaffolding on the exterior of the building. We've tarped in the scaffolding, and we're actually climate controlling the inside of that scaffolding. And the reason we're doing that is because we have materials that are going on the building. We use some epoxies when we are doing stone repair. We use some paint uh, when we're repainting the windows, and then our mortar that's going in between the joints. All of those materials have to go on between a temperature of 40 and 90 degrees. And so, in Oklahoma, as most of us know, you know that's maybe two weeks out of the year. <laughs> we're we're wildly all over the place the rest of the time, and so. By tarping in the scaffolding and climate controlling the inside of that, we're ensuring that you get the maximum life expectancy out of those products that are going on. So, you know, if you don't put your mortar in at the right temperature, maybe you get, you know, 30 years out of it instead of 50 years. If you don't put your epoxies in, maybe you get, you know, maybe you get 10 years instead of 35 years. And so it's all of those things that we're doing to make sure that we're, we've got the focus on quality that we're going to uh, get the most out of the taxpayer dollar instead of, you know, what I've seen in the culture of the past is, well, you know, we don't, let's not spend the money to tarp that in. Let's not spend the money. Let's just throw it up on there. And, you know, in 15 years when it all falls apart, it'll be somebody else's problem at that point. That's not the mantra that we're taking on this project, and, and that's not the way that we're approaching this. Right. It was really 
uh, it was really in, interesting and um, kind of impressive to see truly the artisan um, craftsmen that are working on some of those stone repairs on the outside. And I mean, it, even stuff on the inside. Um, I know I saw online that you guys had have got the generator placed in the basement. Um, and I have a photo of the slab there or where the slab was about to be when it was getting ready to be, to be placed. So um, <clears throat> I think people uh, are interested to kind of see the inner workings and anyone who's ever been a homeowner or, or a car owner or anything understands that there's a certain amount of maintenance that always has to be done. And if you don't, if, if you, if you go for the cheapest option, you get the cheapest outcome there. And so um, it's good to see um, people putting their, uh, not just their time, but their heart into this work and uh, look forward to the building being um, better and stronger and more useful and more responsive, I think, to the needs of the people in the Capitol and those of us out in the public. Uh, well, and I have to give a shout out, uh, if I can, real quick, to our, our workers who are our, our, our tradesmen, our craftsmen who are working on this project, because I assure you, we have some of the finest people in the country working on this project here. When you talk about our stonemasons, we've got stonemasons here that are working on other historic buildings and other state capitals around the country that are also working on ours. When you talk about our interior tradesmen and craftsmen, you know, our plaster workers, our, our sheetrock and our drywall and the people that are, that are uh, just doing the everyday work here, um, to me, it is just phenomenal to watch them do their thing. We are very, very fortunate to have the quality of the workforce that we have here. Yeah, that's um, it. Really was impressive, and I liked that you and I walked into the basement, you know, in our hard hats and goggles and all the safety gear, and it wasn't like a single worker stopped. And we walked in, and a guy started welding something just around the corner, and there's sparks flying, and you could tell like this is a work site, and they're here to get this job done uh, as efficiently as they can. So, uh, so interior should be done, uh, or exterior in 2019, and interior in 2022. That's right. That's right. By the end of 2022, the whole project should be complete, um, and uh, our exterior should be wrapping up by the middle of 2019. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing the completed project. We'll post on our blog some of the photos that I took that day, and I've got some kind of comparison of some of the exterior columns and windows, the before and after, um, for the areas that have already been finished on, on the north side so, so that folks can kind of see that um, that side-by-side of what it looks like Um once you guys are done with some of that work. That's really exciting. Uh, Trade. I hope to uh, see you around the Capitol. I hope you can make it out to some of our events um, this next spring. I've been eyeballing dates this week, and so um, we're, we're going to announce those hopefully before too long. And uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing getting citizens involved in government again. It's a really important thing. And I'd also encourage anybody who wants to um, uh, learn more about the Capital Project, you can go to our website, which is Capital Restore, and that's capital with an O, capitalrestore.ok.gov. We've got videos and blog entries and pictures and all kind of stuff out there. And uh, we've got social media pages as well. You can uh, look up OK Capital Restoration. should find us pretty easily. Yeah, you guys are on, uh, I know, Twitter and Instagram. I follow you on there on Facebook as well. Yes, we're on Facebook as well. Got all the bases covered. Um, all right, super. Well, thanks, Straight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you out there soon. Thanks, Andy. It's been great. Appreciate you having me on. Okay, so that was Trait Thompson. He's the project manager for the Capital Restoration Project at the state capitol here. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, you really should go. Uh, they've got some renderings of what it's going to look like when it's all done in a few years, and it's going to be so much more functional much more accessible and really inviting, which is something that building could definitely use. Uh, so really appreciate Trait for his time today. And also thanks to Joe Dorman for his time uh, in visiting with us about State Question 640 and uh, and kind of where the legislature is at with, uh, with raising some revenue. So this brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for hanging with us. Next week, we're going to highlight a legislator that is currently in office and find out a little bit more about them. I believe it's going to be State Senator David Holt. Uh, we're also going to talk to a couple of advocates who have, uh, and I use the term advocate pretty broadly, but really people who have participated with Let's Fix This and come to the Capitol, maybe got involved in the last couple of years to find out how they got involved, what's going on with them, and uh, and kind of what lessons they've learned 
in the hopes that that kind of information could be transferable uh, to the rest of us, um, to you as well. It might help you get involved or maybe help you know how to pitch this and why you, how to get more involved and how to get your neighbors and friends and family involved as well. So don't forget, you can connect with us on Twitter and Instagram. We are at Let's Fix This OK. And you can like us on Facebook if you haven't already. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Let's Fix This OK. You can also go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, read our blog, uh, and that is letsfixthisok.org. Our podcast is edited and produced by Mostly Harmless Media, and uh, our theme music is generously provided by local heroes, your friends and mine, the Sugar Free All Stars. Let's Fix This is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization who strives to educate and equip all Oklahomans to engage with their government. We encourage you to get involved in any way you can. Remember, decisions are made by those who show up. Thank you.